Good morning. Welcome to Ebenezer Baptist Church. I hope you're excited to be here today to, to praise the Lord. We just sang warming up with the choir. I got all pumped up. Jesus Christ, his great name. We get to sing and glorify him this morning. We get to worship him and to pray to him and to read his word. And if that doesn't get you pumped up, you got to be thinking, why am I here? To worship God. You get pumped up for the Panthers, right? Wait, they're not in the playoffs. Oh, that's right. <laughs> it's okay. Neither are the Steelers. But Jesus Christ is alive well. He has sent his Holy Spirit to be with us. So let's stand and worship. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. See a victory. The weapon. 
heaven may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I've served knows only how to triumph. My God will
seated. God, we come to you this morning and we just thank you so much for being a God who loves us, for being a God who cares about us, a God who calls us your children. And it blows my mind that this God who created the universe, that created everything, who knows our future, who has planned it, who has a will and a plan for our lives. A God who sent his only son to die on the cross for us, who defeated the grave so that our future may be secured. This God is our God. God who did all of that is our God, who is alive, who has sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. And we are so excited, God, to be able to come together to worship you, to praise you, and more importantly, to bow before you and give you our pain, to ask for forgiveness of our sins. guilty. We know that you say come. And we know that our future forever is with you in glory. Not because of what we've done, not because of what we hope to do, but because of what you've done. We fall short all the time, every day. But we can stand up and know that our God is alive, that our God has forgiven us. God, this morning we just praise you. We thank you. We glorify you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Children, you are dismissed. Your teachers are waiting for you in the back.
Amen. All right, let's stand. We're going to sing. It's a newer song. I think we've only done it once. It's called So Will I, a hundred billion times. And the song is about all the things God has done in creation. And the Bible says that even the rocks will cry out. Even the rocks will worship me. And the song is about the creation that God has, God has created and how creation worships him. And so will I. So will we. So let's stand. We're going to sing So Will I. Yeah. 
salvation. You chased down my heart through all of my failure and of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. Yes, Lord. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Where you lost your life so I could find you. Left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done. Every part designed in a work of art. If you've done and chose to surrender, so will I. I can see. Your heart, a billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to say. If you gave your life to others, so will I. Like you would again, a hundred billion times. But what measure could out to your desire. You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Like you would again a hundred billion times. What would measure you could amount to your desire. You're the one who never Amen. You may be seated. have your Bibles. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4. We're going to continue on in our series uh, in the book of Mark. If you're joining us for the first time or haven't been in a while, we've been working through verse by verse uh, the book of Mark, and we're going to continue this morning uh, through chapter 4. Um, a couple announcements before we uh, get started. Uh, one is <clears throat> be in prayer this week. Um, our youth uh, is going to be going to West Virginia skiing and have a time of, uh, of worship and uh, um, teaching and just being together and some skiing in the middle of that. So be in prayer for them. They're going to leave Friday and they will be back Sunday afternoon. So be in prayer for Jason as he's leading them and be in prayer for all those chaperones and students that will be attending that. Um, also for those that are attending, there's going to be a meeting for y'all uh, today at four o'clock in the chapel uh, for everybody that's going to be attending that trip. Um, and then secondly, um, we announced last week, but we have year-end statements, uh, giving statements, and sealed envelopes out in the, uh, the lobby. You can pick those up on your way out today. For those of, that have not been picked up today, we're going to mail them out. Um, so you can grab those on your way out uh, today. And then also there's uh, some collections going on for Book Bags of Love and the WMU and the things that they do uh, mission-wise. You can see that in your bulletin, the list of things that you can bring in and donate towards that. All right, if you have your Bibles, let's look. Mark chapter 4, I'm going to be starting at verse 21. Mark chapter 4, 21. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed, and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, 
nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe at once, he puts it in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. God, thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for giving us this place that we may gather together as your people, your church to worship you, to make much of your name, to sing praises to you, to be reminded of the great and mighty and powerful God that you are. God, as we open your word, we view it as your inspired word, completely true, the authority for our lives. God, I pray that as we look at your word this morning, that you give me the ability just to communicate it clearly and accurately. God, I pray that the work of the Holy Spirit, opens our eyes to see the truth that's found in your word, allows us to apply it to our lives, changes us today. And God, I pray that all that we do brings honor and glory to your great name, and I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, I think you all know this, but studies just kind of back up what we already know, and sometimes that just gives us a little bit of insight, but people are more stressed out than ever. I think you probably know that, can feel that, can see that. Maybe that feels like that's you. People are, studies are showing that people have higher anxiety than ever before. Stress is higher than ever before. Things like inflation, foreign wars, all kinds of things that are going on around you that you feel powerless to. You have no control over it. People feel stressed and they feel anxious, and it's easy to want to give up, just throw in the towel, to say it is what it is. You know, when you think about your own life, much of your life, if you're honest, is trying to control outcomes. You think about the future you want to have, and every day you work hard to get there. You grow up hearing that you can do anything that you want to do if you put your mind to it. And day after day, that's your goal. People tell you you have, you can be what you want to be. As long as you've determined it, and you work hard, and you put in the work, you can control the outcome. And you spend time reading about people that got where you want to go. You see people who made it, and you start to believe this. If I do what they did, I will get to where they got. And the same thing can happen in the church. Church conference after church conference tells you that if you want to get to where we got, then you need to do what we did. And they give you a five-step strategy on how to get there. And if you do this and you follow these principles, you will get to where we got. You know, this was the basis of the religious leaders at the time. They do the right things, and they get the outcomes that they want. Here is the things that I do in order to control the future, to control the outcomes, to control where I'm going. And Jesus comes and really blows all of that up for everyone. He says, listen, you can't control the future. You can't control the outcomes. You are powerless. You can't save yourself. 
That you can do all these things, but ultimately you're going to fail. You can't be perfect. You're going to come up short. You need a Savior. You need one who can do what you can't do. One who can control outcomes. One who has control of the future. This morning, what we're going to see, God's Word, is that we are to focus on the right behaviors. We are to focus on what God says to do in his word, what he gives us clearly to do, our responsibilities. But God makes things grow. God changes outcomes. God controls the future. So let's look in verse 21. And he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear with the measure you use. It will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. For the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So, What we see here is, first off, that Jesus is describing the light, and he is the light. He is, as he's talking in this parable, the light that is represented here is Jesus himself. He says, I am the light. And this light should not be hidden. Jesus has come so that people may know him. Jesus has come so his light may shine into the darkness. He is the light that has come to be made known among the nations, to every tongue, to every tribe. Jesus' name is to be high and lifted up. His name should be made known to all. But you know, we like to compartmentalize things in our life. We like to operate in darkness. We like to hide. And Jesus says here that he is the light and he will not be hidden. This is not something that's going to be left up to people, to governments, to leaders to decide. Jesus' name is not going to be hidden because of the result of a government. Jesus' name is not going to be hidden because of the result of a group of people. You know, right now you see the world and the darkness that's in it. It's easy to look around and to feel hopeless. Like, what can you really do? Like, how can you really impact? Like, what can little things really matter? But just the whole idea of the light, and you all know this is true, that darkness has no power over light. Darkness always loses to light. In fact, if we took this room and we could make it pitch black, where you couldn't see anything, you know that even the smallest light would provide enough light for all of us to find our way out. Just the smallest of light would overcome the darkness of the entire room that we're in right now, that we see that light has power over darkness. Jesus says he is that light, that he has that power over darkness, that nothing will remain hidden, that the light will permeate all darkness. And so then, this light should be lifted up should be put on a stand, should be seen. And he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So there's a truth here. For those that hear, for those that hear in a way that causes you to do, right? We see this happening throughout Scripture. We see this really through the book of Mark that Jesus is saying, listen, when you really hear, you respond. When you hear what the Word of God says, 
it changes you. It changes your actions. You respond to it. See, hearing is not just enough. A, a true hearing of the word of God changes us, changes our actions. And so he says here, those that have ears to hear, let them hear. What will you do then with what you hear? The accountability is once you hear it, what will you do with what you hear? A hearing that leads to change. A hearing that leads to actions. A hearing that changes your behaviors. A hearing that brings responsibility. What are you going to do with what you have heard? And so you ask the, yourself this question. Where is the gospel in your life right now? Where is Jesus in your life right now? Where is Jesus in your work right now? Where is Jesus in your school right now? Where is Jesus in your family right now? Is he high and lifted up? Is he raised up so those around can see? Is he the central focus of all that you do? Is he on that lampstand for others around you to see that this is a person who's following Jesus? This is a person who is lifting up the name of Jesus? This is a person who's making much of the name of Jesus? Or is it hidden under a bushel, put away, compartmentalized? Jesus says this light it's light of the world. Jesus says is to be high, is to be lifted up. And for those of you that have ears to hear, Jesus says, let them hear. A hearing that changes our behaviors. Let's look in verse 26. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if, if a man should scatter seed on the ground, he sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, he knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So the idea of, of here is happening, first off, we see that Jesus is the light, that we have a responsibility to, to make much of his name, to lift up his name, to make him known. For those of you that have ears to hear, we are to make much of Jesus. But then we see, what is our responsibility? Who does the work? Right? Where, where do we factor in all of that? Because there's this idea of things, it says, that happen when you sleep. And see, when things happen when you sleep, what have you done to control that? When, when it says that it's like, it's like a seed that's been planted. And then the person goes to sleep. And growth takes place while they're sleeping. See, the fact that we need sleep, have you ever thought about that? Some of you need more than others, right? We're all wired a little bit differently, but we all need sleep. Nobody can just go without sleep. I've tried. It doesn't work very well. God makes us have to sleep. You know why we have to sleep every day? To remind us that you are not God. That when you sleep, God is still at work. That when you sleep, God is still in control of all things. That when you sleep, God is doing things, working in the world and in the lives of people. That we are not God. And so much like sowing seed that germinates in the night, when the plowing has ceased, when the work has ceased, there's a growth that takes place, and it's a growth that no one can take credit for. So it says we're, we're not to keep the light, Jesus' name hidden, but we also see that God does the work. 
that God does the work in your life, that God does the work in my life. So it's kind of this idea of how we stay in our lane. So many of you probably heard that before. You know, it's important you know, in your job or whatever you're doing to, to stay in your lane, to do what you are supposed to do and what you're responsible for, and then you leave the rest to those that are responsible for that. And so we see this here. We see that we have a responsibility in the kingdom of God. We are to hold up the light who is Jesus. We are to make the gospel known. We are to sow seed. But we're not God. We don't change hearts. We don't make things grow. So when we share the gospel, we are sowing the seed, but we're not changing the hearts. In fact, changing the hearts is an act of the Holy Spirit. Just what I'm doing right now is attempting to stay in my lane. I study the word. I prepare the sermon. I seek to accurately reflect what the word of God says. I spend time But you know what the most important part of all the preparation that I do throughout the week that's really key is prayer. Prayer for all the things that I can't do. Prayer for all the things that only God can do. I can't change people. I can't change hearts. I can't even know the right words to say. I can't communicate in my own ability effectively. The Holy Spirit must do the work. And the outcomes I leave to the Lord because the work that he's doing with that is work when I'm not even around. Things that I may not even know about. Outcomes that I may never see. It's not my role to make outcomes. It's not my role to change hearts. It's not my role to make you follow the word of God. Only God can do that. And he does that through the preaching of the word to his people. Sowing a seed, trusting the outcomes to God. In prayer, I'm asking God to do the work. I'm seeking God to give me wisdom and insight. I'm seeking God to give me words. I'm relying on God to do the work. And guess what happens when I prepare and I don't pray? I'm out of my lane. I'm viewing myself as doing the work. Or what happens when I pray and prepare, but I focus too much on the response I'm viewing myself as being the one who's going to change hearts. I'm viewing myself as the one that's going to make seed grow. That's the work of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So there's a responsibility with what we do with what we hear, which is the word, which is the gospel. And then there's a reminder that God is the one that does the work. There's a responsibility for all of us who are believers, but the work is not up to you. You are not saved because of your good work. Just like you did not make a seed grow and germinate. God saves. God gives us the ability to understand his word. God illuminates us to the truth in his word. You share the gospel. And every one of you that is in Christ is called to share the gospel. But you don't save people. I preach the Bible, but I don't change hearts. We don't determine outcomes. And there's just, there should be a real peace in that. There should be a peace of knowing that it's not all up to me. There should be a peace for you to know it's not all up to me. For those family members you're praying for, for those neighbors you're praying for, for those people you're seeking to witness to, for that school you're trying to impact, for that workplace you're trying to impact, for that community you're trying to impact, there should be some peace of knowing that it's not all up to you. 
God is going to do the work. God is going to determine the outcomes. We have the responsibility to sow the seed. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. Paul says, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. God takes and uses what we do into his kingdom. And you know, the things that you do and the times that you have sown the word of God into others, the times that maybe you have taught a a Sunday school lesson or children's church to young children, you wonder if it made any difference. Sometimes you might have, you may teach week after week or you may share the gospel with other people. You may serve in other areas and you're seeking to, to let people know of the hope that's found in Christ. And you might wonder, does it matter? Does anything I'm doing really matter? You know, I, I keep trying with this person. It just seems like nothing's coming of that. But here's what we know. God takes and uses what we do in his kingdom. And you might never, ever know how God has used you. You might be in your school, your neighborhood, your workplace this week, and you're just seeking to hold up the name of Jesus, and you might not know what God's going to do with that. You might never know what God did with that. But here's what you do. You stay in your lane. You do what God reveals in his word, and you leave the rest of God, and you sleep with a peace that says, I have done what you would have me to do this day. God, allow me to sleep in the peace that you do the rest, even while I sleep. And when you don't know, and you may never know, God does the work. When you think about the future and your life and where it's headed and where am I going to end up and what's going to happen and what about my children and what about my family and what about people around me? You stay in your lane. You do what the word of God says and you leave the outcomes to God. You recognize that God is going to do the work. God is going to change hearts. God's going to lead. God's going to guide. God's going to get you to where he wants you to be. Because God does the work. Now, there's also something that's important to see here. Because it doesn't make us apathetic. It doesn't make us lazy. There's work to do. We shouldn't see, expect to see growth where seed was never planted. You know, last week I talked about my yard. And it was bad until I planted some seed. I didn't make that seed grow. But I can tell you, I should not have expected to see any seed sprout in a yard that seed had not been planted in. For me to sit on my porch and say, God, I'm praying that I have a green lawn in the spring. But I have done nothing to plant any type of seed and expect those type of results. It's crazy, isn't it? Same for us in our Christian lives. We look out in the culture, and we pray, God, this world, and all that's going on in the world, and and the things I'm seeing in the world, and things I'm experiencing, and things my children are experiencing, and I think about the future, where everything's going, and God, I pray that you change things. And you have to ask yourself, have I shared the hope of Christ, the thing that will change things? with anyone lately? Have I pointed anybody to Jesus lately? Have I personally shown anybody, told anybody about the solution to the problem in our world, which is Jesus Christ? Or am I praying for seed to grow that I haven't planted? Same in the church. They look around in the church and you say, God, I pray that the church will grow. I pray that more people will be here. When was the last time you invited somebody to come with you? When was the last time you went over to a neighbor or a friend, a co-worker, and said, you know, you should join me. 
church. We're wanting seed to grow that's never been planted. We have responsibilities. We are supposed to sow seed. God controls the growth. We have work to do, but we trust God with the outcomes. Verse 30, and he said, with what can compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air may make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them and, they, and as they were able to hear it, he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. So God grows his kingdom, his word, here's what we have to see, his word produces more than we could ever ask or think. You think that some of the things that you do is small and insignificant. You think that you are a nobody. And who am I to make any impact in the world that we're living in, make any impact in the community that I'm living in, to make any impact in the school that I go to, to make any impact in the workplace that I'm at? I'm a nobody. Well, I got good news for you. We're all nobodies. But God does abundantly more than we could ever imagine when we are obedient to following him. John 15, 5 says, I am the, va- I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do Nothing. You know, me and the boys were out last night doing, having a little fire pit, and they went around the yard and collected sticks to kind of build the, build the fire pit. And, um, you know, that's all those sticks were good for. All the ones that had broken off and fallen in our yard, they were good for nothing else. They were not going to bear fruit. They were not going to have leaves that were going to appear on them. You know why? Because they were disconnected from the vine. When there's a disconnection from the vine, there is no power, there is no fruit, there is no results, there is no nothing. Jesus says, I am that vine. But when you are connected with me, you will bear much fruit. When we are trying to do things in our own strength, we are limited to our own power, our own ability. You think about that, just look in the world. The greatest accomplishments that man's ever made. And man has done some pretty incredible things. Man's done some pretty neat inventions, built some pretty big buildings. But compare that to the universe. Compare that to what God has spoken into existence. Compare that to what we see in God's creation. Compare that to to God and what he has done, and there's no comparison. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So how do you know when you're operating more in your own strength? How do you know this? Because I think this this is evident for many of us. Many of you right now, you're stressed out, you're anxious, you're worried. You're doing everything you know to do. Nothing seems to be working. The future just frightens you, paralyzes you. So how do you know? How do you know when I'm operating in my own strength? Well, I know in my life, it's a lack of prayer. Many of you wake up every day, and some of you, we've all been there, you wake up and you're just panicked about the day ahead. It's like your eyes are open, you're like, oh man, you know, 
you start to realize what you have in front of you. Some of you don't even make it to waking up. That happens in the middle of the night, and then you try to get back to sleep, and then you get stressed out about the fact that you didn't get sleep, and then you think about the day that not only the day is going to be hard, but now the day is going to be hard, and I'm going to be sleep deprived during that day that's going to be hard, right? And we are thinking about all of the things that day that we have no control over the outcomes. But you know what prayer does? Prayer reorients us around the one who controls the outcomes. See, many of us say we don't have time for prayer. And when you say that, you know what you're saying? I don't have time for prayer because I'm too busy controlling outcomes. I don't have time to pray today because I'm too busy trying to control the future. Instead of calling on the one who can and who does. See, the example that we see is the smallest of seeds, like a mustard seed, grows into something very large. And we see the progression. Who makes the growth? God makes the growth. Christ has all power over darkness. God does all the work. God controls the outcome. God can do greater than anything we can imagine through the seemingly small words or moments where we intentionally try to sow seed. There's so many things in your life that seem so insignificant. Reading the word in the morning seems so insignificant. Just 15 or 20 minutes of just reading the Bible. What is that going to do? Sharing the gospel with a coworker. What's that going to do? And he's teaching a Sunday school lesson to a three-year-old that's hardly even paying attention. What's that going to do? Well, Jesus tells us what it's going to do. What God does with that is greater than anything we can imagine. You think about your future and all the worries and all the things that you have in front of you. And then think about the God that spoke the world into being. The God that controls all things. And see, Jesus comes because Jesus comes to say, listen, you, you don't have that power. You don't have that control. You don't have the ability to save yourself. And so you come to me and your, your belief in me. I've, I've come to stand in your place. I've come to do what you can't do. And ultimately, Jesus defeats death itself arising from the dead. Why can the outcomes be so great? Because God does the work. As we close, I want to read Ephesians 3.20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for its power and its authority. God, I know that many of us here today are struggling, are anxious, are stressed, are worried. And God, I pray that as we see in your word, you have shown us what we are to do. You are sh- you've shown us how we are to invest our time. You have shown us how we are to live. And you have shown us that you are a God that is in control of the outcomes. That you're a God that works when we sleep. You're a God that knows all things. A God that's in control of all things. And that you sent us your one and only son, Jesus, who came and lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. Who died the death that we deserved. Who stood in our place. Who paid our debt. Who rose from the grave. Defeating the sting of death. So that we might live for him. God, I pray that we might all experience the peace 
of trusting in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, of walking with Jesus, of knowing that you, God our Father, is the one who controls the outcomes, the one who does exceedingly more than we could ever imagine, the one who leads us, guides us, knows our future. God, may we trust you today. May we lay down the burdens, the cares, the worries today. And God, I pray for those here today that recognize that what they do to advance your kingdom matters because you are at work. God, I pray that your people today may be encouraged to continue to teach the word, continue to share the gospel, continue to invest in others, continue to take the word of God into the schools and workplaces and communities. That when we are doing your work with your word, relying on your power, our work is never in vain. God, help us to stay encouraged, to persevere, and to trust you. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this is our time to respond, and it may be that for some of you, you might not have prayed in a while. And this just may be a time that you just need to really just get on your knees before the Lord and pray. And just to give some of the things that you have been carrying, some of the burdens that you've been trying to do on your own. Maybe a time that you just respond to God's word through prayer. Maybe that a commitment you need to make today. There may be something that you need to commit to God today through his word. There may be people that God has placed on your heart that you've given up on. You've been sharing the word with them. You've been trying to minister to them, but you've just, you've just given up. And you just need to be encouraged today to stay at it, knowing that God is the one that controls the outcomes. Whatever that is for you, however you are to respond to God's word, as we stand and we sing, I encourage you, respond to the word of God this morning. I love you.